Good morning, everyone. It's Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. Um, we're continuing our worship in this COVID-19 time by conference call, and I'm continuing to uh, give our Bible reading and sermon uh, on video for those who couldn't make it. So uh, here we go. I'm uh, going to start with just a few verses from Proverbs 6, starting at verse 16. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers and sisters. You know, sometimes preachers plan a certain kind of sermon and then have to change in response to events in the news. And this is one of those weeks. So I'm pausing our series on Philippians so that I can address the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the protests and riots that have followed his death. And then I promise I'm going to connect that back up to the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 before we're done. You know, I'm, I'm doing this because I know that we all care about our country. And I do it because a lot of what is going on has to do with our Christian faith and our Christian values. Now, there are a lot of verses in Proverbs that deal with violence and basically just tell us to avoid it. Um, I just read some from chapter 6. And here's one more, 1911 from Proverbs. Good sense makes one slow to anger. And it is glory to overlook an offense. Now, I do think we are people of good sense. So if one of us proposes that we go set fire to a dumpster because of what happened to George Floyd, I think we would probably just all say no and try to calm down the person who says that. And similarly, if one suggested that we ought to go knock down some guy and put our knee on his neck, we would also say no to that. By the way, if someone missed the details here, George Floyd, age 46, an African-American man, was accused of paying uh, with a counterfeit $20 bill in Minneapolis. In the process of arresting him, one officer had his knee on his neck while others were pressing down other parts of his body. The video is horrifying, and if you haven't seen it, you should look at it at least once. Um, all of this happens despite his pleading that he couldn't breathe in the protests of the crowd. Um, that were people who'd gathered around that could see how much he was being hurt. Somebody called an ambulance, and by the time it arrived, there was no pulse. Now, no one wanted that outcome or would advocate for it, but it happened. It's an awful thing, something worth protesting. But like a river outflowing its banks, the protests have metastasized into riots in some places. George Floyd's family has asked for restraint. I don't know who this woman is, Queen Mother Chui, but she was at one of the scenes last night and said, I am disappointed with the people who are causing trouble. We came here in peace and we want to leave here in peace. Why is it so hard to stop the violence? Because these are not isolated incidents. You know, it wasn't that just suddenly these things happened without any other context around. In fact, the context is really important. They, these events have deep roots in the injustices of the past, and they produce a deep-seated fear of what will happen in the future. I don't have time to survey the racial history of the United States, but we of course began with kidnapping people from Africa and forcing them into slavery. It took the Civil War to end that atrocity. And we had a hundred years of unjust treatment under the Jim Crow laws in a period where white people lynched black people, which means they put their neck in a noose and hung them without any kind of trial, either because they'd been accused of a crime or because they were just deemed uppity. Then we had an enormous civil rights struggle that made some gains. 
we ended segregation for schools, restrooms, and drinking fountains, but that of course didn't solve all the problems. Explicit segregation based in law changed into implicit segregation based on economics and more subtle forms of discrimination. And there is this pattern of white police officers killing unarmed black people. I could tick off a dozen cases that made the national news just off the top of my head, including some people who were fatally shot while at home. But you see, this isn't just about the past. I heard some moving discussions this week from black people who are afraid in the present that their brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, and children will be killed just for being black. And it isn't an abstract worry, it's a visceral fear. And if something doesn't change, they fear that it will continue into the future. They are worried for their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And that is why there is a push for change now. And honestly, it is a legitimate question. Will you generate more change by staying home and writing letters or by going out and protesting and even rioting? I recently saw an old movie, Do the Right Thing. Could have been made today, but it's from 1989. It's a beautiful study of race relations in a Brooklyn neighborhood. Eventually, a fight breaks out between some black people and some white people. The police come, grab a black man, and choke him to death. Then the police leave. And a young black man throws a trash can through the window of a pizzeria, which leads to it being burned down. I read the Wikipedia entry on the movie in which Mr. Spike Lee commented on the fact that only white people ask him about whether it was right for the boy to throw the trash can. Black viewers understand that the rage from the death of the black man at the hands of police minutes before is what generates the subsequent violence. Mr. Lee says that viewers who question the riot are explicitly failing to see the difference between damage to property and the death of a black man. That line made me wince because it exposed my personal bias and guilt. Indeed, Lynn and I had spent much more time talking about the property damage than the death of the human being in the movie. Let me summarize all this by saying that black people who have experienced actual oppression for centuries are genuinely afraid for their families. And you can't turn to a person who is afraid and tell them, your fears are invalid. That doesn't cut it. Worse yet, it denies their humanity. It patronizes them by telling them that their experience is invalid and that you, the speaker, know more about it than they do. And this is what brings us to the day of Pentecost and Acts chapter 2. It's 40 days since Jesus' death and his resurrection on Easter. His followers have been waiting and hiding and waiting some more. They're probably kind of bored. Something is supposed to happen and they don't know exactly what it is until suddenly it happens. Let me read from Acts 2 verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, with flame coming down. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Notice that the miracle is one of communication and understanding. They all rush out into the street where there are people from all over the known world with different skin colors and speaking different languages, and different backgrounds. And when the followers of Jesus speak, they are perfectly understood by everyone. The people are amazed how 
all these Galileans, are, they each hear them in their own native language, what they're used to. So look at this. If the danger in the present circumstance is that we deny one another's humanity, that we misunderstand each other, that we view each other as different races, the Holy Spirit produces the opposite of that. The Spirit brings understanding, compassion, sympathy, and yes, also conviction. We spoke last week about how in Christ, God took the form of a slave to love and serve us and even suffer death on a cross for our sake, all of us. And Peter explains this to the crowd in Acts chapter 2. Some of them probably weren't even in Jerusalem when Jesus was murdered by the authorities. But Peter and his hearers make it clear that we are all complicit in Jesus' death. We all participate in what society and humanity does. Some of the blood is on our hands, even if indirectly. We all took a turn hammering the nails into Jesus' brown flesh. And with the Spirit, we are all brought together to move toward new life together. Which leads us to Acts 2, verses 37 to 39. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They all need to repent and be forgiven. So do we. We all need to die to the old life and the old ways so that we can be raised to a new, better life. A life of love, peace, grace, and hope. And this didn't just apply to the people who were there then. Verse 39. The promise is for you for your children and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. Isn't that what we all want? For the promise to be for everyone, every race and clan, every group, all the people alive today and all their children and grandchildren. As Christians, we more than other people should believe in the hope for a new and better life and a more just society. The world needs justice to have peace. And as Christians, we believe that God is healing this world and its hurts, that everything is being made new. And we, as followers of God, disciples of Christ, get to be a part of that process. In whatever way we can, small or large, empowered by the Holy Spirit, wrapped in God's love, let us be people of peace who work for change, change that comes through justice and justice that brings real peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may it be so and may it be soon. Amen.